Many people with ties to Des Moines County, Iowa, played a role in the American Civil War. These are some of their stories. Imagine, if you will, that it's Saturday, April 13th, 1861. You work six days a week, so off you make for downtown. As you walk by the Burlington Hawkeye, you notice a crowd gathering outside. They seem excited. Southern forces under General Beauregard fired on Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor the day before. America is at war with itself. Eleven southern slave-holding states left the Union and formed the Confederate States of America. The northern free states were referred to as the Union or Federals. And while Virginia was a Confederate state, its mountainous region in the Northwest remained loyal to the Union. It became the new state of West Virginia. Four slaveholding states, Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware, remained in the Union, but with a troubled mix of loyalties. Together, they formed the border states. The North put over two million men in uniform, the South over one million. The North's commander-in-chief was President Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln gave a speech in Burlington in 1858 when he was running for a Senate seat in Illinois against Stephen Douglas. There's a plaque at Main and Valley that marks the location where the speech was delivered. Lincoln stayed at the Barrett House on the corner of 3rd and Jefferson while he was in town. The Tama Building stands at its former location. The Commander-in-Chief of the Confederacy was President Jefferson Davis. In early 1833, Iowa was not yet open for settlement. As a young lieutenant in the U.S. Army, Davis was in the area that later became Burlington to evict squatters. Two days after the attack on Fort Sumter, President Lincoln called for 75,000 volunteers to put down the rebellion. Both sides thought the war would be short and that they would easily defeat their opponents. Little did they know of the horrors to come. The federal government asked Iowa for 780 men. Governor Samuel Kirkwood immediately called for volunteers. The nation is in peril. A fearful attempt is being made to overthrow the Constitution and dissever the Union. And almost 8,000 answered his call. Including this volunteer who served with the 23rd Iowa Infantry throughout the war. Overall, Iowa sent 78,000 men to fight for the Union. 43% of all of those who were eligible to serve. Iowa provided a larger percentage of its men to the war effort than any other state in the Union. Des Moines County supplied 1,699 of Iowa's soldiers. More Des Moines County men probably would have enlisted, but the County Board of Supervisors consisted of Democrats, and they refused to follow the example of the other counties and offer a bounty, a bonus for enlisting. Much to the frustration of the editor of the pro-union Republican Burlington Hawkeye, Clark Dunham. In less than a month after the start of the war, Des Moines County was sending off troops. Here you see area soldiers boarding the Kate Russell for Keokuk on May 7, 1861. Burlington's Charles L. Mathias was the first person in the United States to tender a military company to the national government. Charles Mathias, affectionately called Old Dutchy by his men, was born in Prussia in 1824 and served as an officer in their army before moving to Burlington in 1849. When the Civil War began, he was commissioned captain of the 5th Iowa Infantry. In 1863, Matthias was promoted to Brigadier General. He fought at Wilson's Creek, Island No. 10, Luca, Vicksburg, Corinth, and Chattanooga. Matthias was severely wounded in one battle and captured in another. Worn out by his exertions, he died in Burlington at the Union Hotel at Main and Elm and was buried in Aspen Grove Cemetery in 1868. This is a picture of Burlington shortly before the outbreak of war. Des Moines County was home to two military camps. 
Camp Warren was a cavalry training center and was established in the first year of the war. This picture is from Harper's Weekly. The camp was not as nice as the picture made it out to be. Do you recognize where it was located? It currently looks like this. Now do you know where it was? It was located near the northwest corner of Roosevelt and Agency. Camp Warren was named after Fitz Henry Warren. Warren was born in Massachusetts in 1816 and moved to Burlington in 1844. He was an anti-slavery Whig who later became a Republican. He was one of the chief editorial writers for the New York Tribune and a frequent contributor to the editorial columns of the Burlington Hawkeye. He served as a colonel of the 1st Iowa Cavalry and became a major general by the end of the war. This is a picture of his home in Burlington. Recognize it? It is located Caddy Corner from the Des Moines County Heritage Center, the old library, and is currently being restored. After the war, Warren returned to Burlington but eventually went back east, where he served as the Assistant Postmaster General and later as Minister to Guatemala. General Warren died in 1878 and was buried in Brimfield, Massachusetts. Burlington's other encampment was Camp Warren. It was an infantry training center established early in the war. Camp Warren was located behind the Burlington College, the current site of the former Burlington High School, now the abandoned Apollo Building. The camp was named after Jacob Lauman. Lauman was a prominent Iowa businessman when the war started. He was commissioned colonel of the 7th Iowa Volunteers in 1861 and was a major general by the war's end. He fought at Fort Donaldson, Shiloh in the Hornet's Nest, Vicksburg, and Jackson, Mississippi. This is a drawing of Lauman's charge at the Battle of Fort Donaldson. The battle at Jackson, Mississippi in 1863 did not go well, and he was sent back to Burlington to await further orders. The orders never came. Lauman died in 1867 and was buried in Aspen Grove Cemetery. This is a bust of Lauman at the Vicksburg National Battlefield site in Mississippi. North Oak Street School at 9th and Oak was renamed Jacob Gartner Lauman School in 1913. Lauman School was torn down in 1930. A new school was built on the site and was named Oak Street School. Most people in Des Moines County are familiar with General Coors. John Murray Coors was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 1835 and moved to Burlington as a child. When the Civil War broke out, he was commissioned as Major of the 6th Iowa Infantry. In 1863, he was promoted to Brigadier General. He is best known for his defense of the Union Supply Depot at Alatoona Pass, Georgia. It was there on October 5, 1864, that the Confederate General Samuel French demanded that course surrender to avoid a needless effusion of blood. To which the greatly outnumbered course replied, We are prepared for the needless effusion of blood when it is agreeable to you. It was a Union victory, but only at a high cost. The combined percentages of Union and Confederate casualties were equaled only by the Battle of Gettysburg. The day after the battle, course sent a famous telegram to General Sherman that read, I am short one cheekbone and one ear, but am able to whip all hell yet. All his portraits from then on are profiled so as to hide his wounds. Course was mustered out of the service in 1866 as a major general. His post-war career took him to Massachusetts where he became postmaster of Boston. He died in Winchester, Massachusetts on his 58th birthday in 1893 and was buried in Aspen Grove Cemetery. The Union victory at Alatoona Pass was commemorated with a statue in Crapo Park. It was unveiled in 1896. The statue was refurbished and rededicated in 2006. Course School is actually named after General Course's father, John Lockwood Course, who was an early leader in the Burlington school system.
Another interesting and impressive general was James Isham Gilbert. Gilbert was born in 1823 in Kentucky, but moved to Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin, where he grew up and was educated. Prairie du Chien was a wilderness then. Gilbert traded with the Indians and lived among them for a time. He later moved to Iowa and planted the town of Lansing. It was there that he began a career in the lumber business. Gilbert supplied the lumber for the Mormon temple in Nauvoo, Illinois, and stayed there for a while until a, quote, sinful Mormon, unquote, robbed him of all his money. Gilbert returned to Lansing and remained there until the start of the war. General Gilbert fought in the following battles, Little Rock, Meridian, Fort de Rossi, Pleasant Hill, Old River Lake, Tupelo, Nashville, and Fort Blakely. It was said of him by one of his soldiers, many, many times have I seen him when on a long march right along the line till he saw some lame and tired soldier, when he would dismount and having placed the weary one on his steed, would himself walk, perhaps for miles, till he reached camp. Then always before he retired, he made a visit to each tent in the regiment. After the war, Gilbert moved to Burlington and joined his brothers in the lumber business. They were located near the railroad tracks at Jefferson and North 8th Street. Gilbert built and lived in the Starker House, now often called the Leopold Home. It is still standing today and is an impressive building. In 1877, he hooked up with Diamond Joe Reynolds, the Steamboat King. The Diamond Joe Lines, if you did not know, dominated the upper Mississippi riverboat traffic during much of the mid-1800s. Their business adventure proved disastrous and consumed a large share of Gilbert's ample fortune. General Gilbert died in 1884 in Topeka, Kansas and was buried in Aspen Grove Cemetery. In all honesty, few of you have probably ever heard of General Gilbert but I bet most of you recognize the name of his sister-in-law, Hetta Gilbert. There is a charity sale held in her honor every year in Burlington. Des Moines County had several other generals. General David Remick was with the Quartermaster Corps, an army marches on its stomach, you know. He was buried in Aspen Grove in 1901. General Joseph Stone returned to Burlington after the war and practiced medicine for many years. Stone was later elected to the U.S. House of Representatives. He was buried in Aspen Grove in 1902. And there is General Clark Weaver. Weaver was a successful money lender in Burlington before the war. During one battle, the Confederate General John Bell Hood demanded that Weaver surrender his position Weaver replied, in my opinion, I can hold this post. If you want it, come and take it. And he held his post. After the war, he became a wealthy Fort Madison banker and founded the town of Weaver. He was buried in the Fort Madison City Cemetery in 1874. One more person with Des Moines County ties served as a general during the Civil War. John C. Breckenridge. Breckenridge was born in Kentucky in 1821 and moved to Burlington when it was still a territory. He was a city attorney in 1843, but moved back to Kentucky shortly thereafter. One contemporary account stated that there were so many talented young men in Burlington at the time that the competition to rise to the top was too great for Breckenridge, so he went home. But he did all right, though. He was a U.S. congressman, a U.S. senator, an ambassador to Spain, and the vice president of the United States under James Buchanan. He ran for president in 1860, carried the South, but lost the election to Lincoln. His loyalties belonged to the South, and he served both as a Confederate general and as their Secretary of War. He fought in the battles of Shiloh, Port Hudson, Stones River, Chickamauga, Missionary Ridge, New Market, Cold Harbor, and Monocacy. After the war, Breckenridge returned to Kentucky and practiced law. He died in 1875 and was buried in Lexington, Kentucky. Let us not forget the Navy. 
George Remy was born in Burlington in 1841. He graduated from the Navy Academy at Annapolis in 1859 and served in the Union blockade of southern ports during the Civil War. In 1863, he was captured during an ill-fated boat attack on Fort Sumter and was imprisoned over the next 13 months in a jail at Columbia, South Carolina. He almost succeeded in escaping by tunneling under the prison walls. Remy remained in the Navy after the war and was promoted to Rear Admiral in 1898. He was the first U.S. Admiral born west of the Mississippi. Remy commanded the Asiatic Squadron that up to that time was the largest fleet ever commanded by an American naval officer. He retired in 1903. This is a bust of Admiral Remy at the Des Moines County Heritage Center. Admiral Remy died in 1882 and was buried in Arlington Cemetery in Washington, D.C. A destroyer named after Remy fought in World War II. Another Civil War sailor with ties to Des Moines County was Julius Breitenstein. He was born in St. Louis in 1847 and was living with his family in Farmington, Iowa when the war broke out. Breitenstein was involved in the Battle of the First Ironclads, the Monitor and the Merrimack. The Merrimack was originally a wooden ship in the U.S. Navy. It was confiscated by the Confederates and converted into an ironclad. It was rechristened the CSS Virginia. Julius Breitenstein was on the CSS Virginia. He was a Confederate sailor. After the war, he moved to Burlington and worked at the CB&Q Railroad Shops in West Burlington as an engineer. Breitenstein died in 1920 and is buried in Aspen Grove Cemetery. A Confederate memorial cross marks his service. No war history would be complete without mentioning a few privates. German-born Nicholas Bouquet was only 18 years old when he was in his first battle. As a private in Company D, 1st Iowa Volunteer Infantry, he met the Confederates on August 10, 1861 at Wilson's Creek near Springfield, Missouri. The fighting was fierce. At one point, he voluntarily left the line of battle and exposing himself to imminent danger from a heavy fire of the enemy, assisted in capturing a riderless horse at large between the lines and hitching him to a disabled gun, saved the gun from capture. This is a painting of Bouquet rescuing the cannon. For his actions at Wilson's Creek, Nicholas Bouquet received the Medal of Honor. Bouquet's enlistment was up after Wilson's Creek, so he returned to Burlington. He re-enlisted in 1862. Did he re-enlist out of patriotism? Or maybe to seek excitement? Or maybe it was because there was a warrant for his arrest on an assault charge. Whatever his reasons for re-enlisting, Bouquet was on Sherman's famous March to the Sea, or infamous, depending on where you place your sympathies. After the war, General George A. Stone, as the former colonel of the 25th Iowa Infantry, presented the regimental colors to Nicholas Bouquet for bravery and heroism displayed while serving his country. Bouquet returned to Burlington and joined the police department. They must have forgotten about the arrest warrant. Bouquet died in Burlington in 1912 and was buried in Aspen Grove Cemetery. Three other Civil War Medal of Honor recipients lived in Des Moines County at one time or another. In April of 1862, Private William Reddick and 21 other Ohio soldiers wearing civilian clothes secretly made their way to Big Shanty, Georgia. They stole a train called the General and made a run for Union lines, burning bridges and tearing up track as they fled. They were all caught and imprisoned. Eight of them were hanged as spies. The rest either escaped or were released in a prisoner exchange. In 1863, as a group, they were the first soldiers to receive the U.S. Medal of Honor. After the war, Reddick lived on a farm in northern Des Moines County, near Kasuth. He later moved to Loisa County. 
Reddick died in 1903 and was buried in the Lettsville Cemetery. James Gardner was one of 14 African Americans to receive the Medal of Honor during the Civil War. Gardner was born a free man in Virginia in 1839. He was a private in the U.S. Army 2nd North Carolina African descent. His unit was pinned down by heavy enemy fire during the Battle of Chaffin's Farm, Virginia. When they were ordered to attack, only Gardner charged. He killed a Confederate officer who was trying to rally his troops. He moved around some after the war and lived in Burlington near the corner of 3rd and Division for a year. His home burned down in 1896 and he moved on. Gardner died in 1905 and was buried in Calvary Cemetery in Ottumwa, Iowa. John Whitmore was a private in Company F, 119th Illinois Infantry. In April of 1865, Whitmore, under severe and rapid fire from artillery and musketry, captured this Confederate battle flag at Fort Blakely, Alabama. After the war, Whitmore farmed in Pleasant Grove Township. He died in 1901 and was buried in the settlement of Pleasant Grove at the Shinar Cumberland Presbyterian Church Cemetery. His tombstone denotes that he was a recipient of the Medal of Honor. Despite its overwhelming support for the Union, not all Iowans were in favor of the war. The Peace Democrats referred to themselves as Copperheads, after the likeness of Lady Liberty, which they cut from copper pennies and proudly wore as badges. The Republicans thought of them as being more like Copperhead snakes. There was a great deal of strife in southeastern Iowa. Unknown bushwhackers took pot shots at the principal of North Hill School because they thought he was not as loyal to the Union as he ought to have been. Fortunately, they were poor shots. Others wanted to negotiate an end to the war. There were several such peace rallies in Danville. And all over the North and South, families were split over the war. Danville was no exception. The Cresep family from Danville had two sons go off to war. William fought for the Confederacy. James fought for the Union and ended up in Andersonville Prison. Fortunately, they both survived. Albert Newell was also a Danville resident. He was born in Tennessee in 1840 and moved with his family to Danville as a child. He was working as a clerk in 1860. Newell was visiting a cousin in Tennessee when the war broke out and he joined the Confederate Army. He died as a prisoner of war at the age of 24 on May 29, 1865 in Fort Delaware, about a month after Lee surrendered. His body was returned to Danville for burial in the Pleasant Grove Cemetery located near New London, Iowa. However, feelings were still running high and his remains were buried at the edge of the cemetery. Many years later, the cemetery grew out around his grave. There are now markers that recognize his service to the Confederacy. The North was even split on the issue of slavery. The Burlington Daily Hawkeye stated on December 4, 1861, Our armies are not sent upon a mission of philanthropy to the Negro, but to compel submission to the laws by those in rebellion. The Burlington Argus announced on December 30th, 1862, that after January 1st, because of the Emancipation Proclamation, it would protest against a further continuance of the war. <music> Nevertheless, over 178,000 free blacks and freed slaves served during the last two years of the war and bolstered the Union effort at a critical time. By the war's end, the United States colored troops made up approximately a tenth of the Union's strength. While war is a dangerous proposition for all soldiers, African Americans knew they faced even greater perils. At least until late in 1863, most white soldiers on either side could expect to be released in a prisoner exchange if they were captured. African American soldiers, on the other hand, were at grave risk of being summarily executed or returned to slavery if they were captured. 
1,153 African Americans enlisted in the 1st Iowa Colored Infantry, more than 17 from Des Moines County. They served as the 60th Regiment U.S. Colored Infantry. And while Iowa's pool of eligible African American men was small, almost every one of them served. 16-year-old Henry Cowden of Columbia, Missouri enlisted in the 1st Iowa in 1863. He was probably like many other African-American soldiers. He wanted to prove to the world that he was as good as any other man and to put an end to slavery. Ironically, he was not free to do so. He was a runaway. He stole himself from his legal owners. Even though he enlisted after the Emancipation Proclamation was issued, the proclamation did not free the slaves in the border states. They remained in bondage. Therefore, the government compensated his former owner's estate $300 for the loss of their slave. Even more ironic, his former owner was Judge David Todd, Mary Todd Lincoln's uncle. Cowden moved to Iowa after he was discharged and settled in Burlington in 1871. He lived on Main Street south of Angular and was employed at the Pickle Works. His wife Rosa, also a former slave, was a founding member of our AME Church. Cowden died at the age of 50 in 1895 from complications related to an injury he received in the service. He was buried at Aspen Grove Cemetery in a soldier's grave. Men were not the only ones who came forward during the war. Tens of thousands of women served as nurses on both sides, and hundreds of thousands of women joined ladies' aid societies to collect and distribute food, bandages, blankets, clothes, and medicine. Women from First Congregational, Old Zion Methodist, Cumberland Presbyterian, Christ Episcopal, and other area churches were steadfast in their support. One woman with Des Moines County ties stands out, Almira Fales. Almira came to Burlington in 1837 with her second husband, Leander Lockwood. They ran the Black Hawk Hotel, later known as the Harris House. It was located on North Main Street where the library staff parking lot is now. After her husband died, she married Joseph Fales. Fales was hired as an examiner at the U.S. Patent Office shortly after Charles Mason became the commissioner. So after many years in Burlington, Joseph and Elvira Fales were off to Washington, D.C. You may recall that Mason was one of Burlington's founders and was also the first Chief Justice of the Iowa Supreme Court. What you probably did not know was that he was first in his class at West Point, followed by Robert E. Lee. Mason had hired a competent young woman to work in his office and paid her the same wage as a man received a highly unusual and controversial practice at the time. The young woman boarded with Joseph and Elmira Fales. Elmira was sure that war was near and she began preparing for casualties. Most everyone else believed that it would never come to that and they scoffed at her efforts. Her persistence, however, inspired the young boarder to join the nursing corps once the war began. That young woman was Clara Barton the angel of the battlefield and founder of the American Red Cross. The U.S. Sanitary Commission was so impressed with Fales that they put two ambulances under her command. For a while, she was placed in charge of transferring soldiers from Washington, D.C. hospitals to hospitals in New York and elsewhere. She was so dedicated to the cause that she put up a tent in her yard to minister to the needs of soldiers who had nowhere else to receive care. Fales was the first woman to serve upon a hospital ship and spent many months at sea. She served at Shiloh, the Peninsula, the Seven Days Battles, Harrison Landing, James River, Culpeper, Slaughter Mountain, Alexandria, Fortress Monroe, Corinth, and Fredericksburg. She was absent from home for weeks and months at a time, exposed to all weathers, living in tents and ambulances, she was never sick a day while the work lasted, but when it grew to a close and after the excitements of the war had ceased to act as stimulants, 
She began to feel the effects of her great exertions, and disease was rapid in its results. Elmira Fales died in 1868 and was buried in Washington, D.C. To honor her service, government offices were closed the day of her funeral. Lee surrendered at Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia on April 9, 1865 after four years of bloody conflict. And while all hostilities did not end immediately, in effect, the war was over. You can see a list of the Des Moines County soldiers and their fates at the courthouse. 131 were wounded, 38 were held as prisoners of war, and 235 died of wounds or illness. Of the Iowans who served, one out of five died, 13,001 overall. 515 died as prisoners of war, 3,540 died of battle wounds, 8,498 died of disease. The South suffered more than 137,000 wounded, 72,524 killed in action, with 260,000 deaths overall. The North had 275,200 wounded, 140,414 killed in action, and 365,000 total deaths, including 68,178 African American soldiers. And yet there was one more death for the nation to mourn. On April 14, 1865, less than a week after Lee surrendered, President Lincoln was shot at Ford's Theater. Iowa was there. Iowa Governor William Stone was a political confidant of President Lincoln. He was in Ford's Theater that night. He helped carry Lincoln across the street to the Peterson Boarding House, stayed with him until he died, and was one of Lincoln's pallbearers. Let us end where we began. This picture was taken as the American flag was being raised over Fort Sumter for the first time in over four years, without question now, on U.S. soil. And we can all be proud of the people from Des Moines County, men and women, black and white, who helped bring about this new birth of freedom.